Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. Um, my name is Kyle Rankin, and I'm the chief security officer for a company called Purism. Uh, we make security and privacy focused uh, hardware like laptops and phones that runs free software. Um, in addition to that, I, uh, in the past, have uh, written a number of technical books, uh, most recently one called Linux Hardening in Hostile Networks, uh, and up until recently worked, uh, wrote for Linux Journal um, while it was around. So, uh, all right. Yeah, that's exciting. Cool, okay. Um, so, yeah, so, but today we are going to talk about a piece of software called Heads. Um, so as a little introduction, uh, for starters, I am not a BIOS, UEFI, or TPM expert by any means. In fact, the, I would say the resident expert in that is giving a talk uh, in the other building right now, Matthew Garrett, um, on similar things in a way. Uh, so if you have detailed questions about that, um, he's your man. Um, that said, I do have some experience uh, with uh, things like Core Boot and Libre Boot. Uh, so that is the smallest picture ever. Okay, um, let's see if we can, can we make that bigger. Impossible, doesn't matter. Um, that's really odd. Anyway, so that's a, that's a very small picture of me connecting a Pomona clip to my ThinkPad X200. Um, the other side of it is connected to a Raspberry Pi, um, and I was using that to flash Core Boot for the first time on a ThinkPad. Uh, usually ThinkPads, they don't allow you to do a software flash uh, as, the, as the precursor to installing Core Boot. So if you want Core Boot on them, usually you have to open them up, find out which of, those, which of the small chips is the bias chip, um, attach a clip to it, and then run some pretty scary software, and do some pretty scary things the first time, and hope that you didn't brick anything. Um, so I have done that in the past. That was sort of my entry into running Core Boot. So uh, just over two years ago, I uh, joined Purism to uh, help work on security and uh, of the products in a lot of a lot of different avenues, really. Uh, and in particular, my first assignment when I got there was integration with Heads. Uh, the company had announced, uh, a year before I believe, uh, Tremel Hudson had given a talk at CCC where he introduced the Heads project that he had created. Um, and I saw that and Purism saw that and thought, well, that would be really great um, because the laptops already run Core Boot and this, is, uh, this also uses Core Boot. It would be really great to get that working on the laptops. And so when I joined, this was my first assignment was Let's get um, heads working on our laptops. Uh, so even though I'm by no means an expert, I had to get ramped up pretty quickly on how all of these different pieces fit together. So for the purposes of this talk, what I'm going to talk about is one, why tamper evident boot matters to begin with? Why will we go to the trouble of doing this? Um, what's, why is it important? Uh, then I'm going to dive into how Heads works, how it achieves the things that it claims to achieve. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the usability challenges when you enable a system like this that detects tampering. Uh, there's, it's, there's actually some relatively challenging usability challenges with it, uh, especially because it was originally created for security experts. And over time, as we've wanted to get in the hands of more people, we've had to do a lot of changes to it to make it more usable. So why does it even matter? Why do we really care about um, detecting tampering in the boot process? So, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to attack a system. Um, more commonly, you might go to some sort of malicious website, open a malicious attachment, um, bad executable, someone finds a vulnerability on your system some other way and compromises it and just uses your resources remotely. Um, there's all kinds of different avenues into the system. Uh, but if you are an attacker, most ta attackers have a goal to um, persist in the system in a way that you can't detect. So it's not just about um, doing something once on your system. Ideally, um, they'd like to stay in the system as long as they can without you knowing that they're there. The longer that, th that they are in there, um, the more they can potentially use your resources, depending on what, what, how they're going to use your machine. Some attacks are easier to detect than others. So someone who um, is mining bitcoins on your machine is pretty easy to detect because your fan starts kicking on um, sometimes or you know if you're 
on a laptop maybe, your battery life is draining down. Some, sometimes attackers are very, it's very obvious that they're on there. Um, then there are some less, less obvious ways to detect. Uh, sometimes attackers will modify your um, important system uh, binaries. So they might modify bash, for instance. So when you execute bash, you're executing a backdoor version of bash. That's more challenging to detect, but you can go into the system um, and compare that version of bash which, with a known good version of bash and see whether, whether it's been modified. Um, but when you, we're talking about BIOS and kernel and NITRD backdoors, they're the hardest to detect. And uh, the reason that they're so difficult to detect um, reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Emo Phillips, um, where he says, uh, I once thought that the brain was the most wonderful organ in the human body, and then I remembered who was telling me this. So the worst part about a kernel in an NITRD backdoor or a BIOS backdoor is when you want to test uh, whether something's been backdoored, you're asking the system that's been backdoored whether it's been backdoored or not. And if it's been backdoored, it will say, yeah, everything's fine. There's no, there's no malware here. Everything's good. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, whereas if we're talking just about a binary on the system, otherwise you can ask it without, if there's no kernel backdoor, you can check bin bash and it won't report that it's been back. It, you can see whether it's been backdoored. If the kernel's been compromised, um, kernel root kits help um, attackers obscure those kinds of checks. So you can check bin bash to see whether it's been backdoored, and it will report um, everything's fine. It will hide, a kernel rootkit can hide processes running on the system, all that sort of thing. So it's way more difficult to detect that level of tampering. When you go to the BIOS, even more so, um, because it's, most people don't really have the means to test whether the BIOS is legitimate or not. The thing is that the, the entire trust of your system is anchored in the boot code. The very first um, binary that's executed on your system um, starts the trust in the system, and everything else is hinging off of that. If you can't trust the BIOS, then you can't trust the kernel that it loads. If you can't trust the kernel that it loads, then you can't trust the executables further down in the system. Again, you're asking these things that you can't trust whether everything's okay. Um, so you have to have some way to verify that those things that all of your trust is anchoring in are trustworthy first. So um, in particular, if you can't trust the boot process, when you first boot a system these days, hopefully, you use systems like disk encryption. And so at some point early on when you first use your computer, you're going to be typing in um, some kind of a secret, either a disk decryption passphrase or maybe, maybe just a login. Um, but either way, when you first turn on this, the system, you're entering a secret that you probably don't want to share. Um, and so if you can't trust the boot process, if someone can backdoor that, then those secrets are put at risk. And if those secrets are exposed, then someone can use those secrets to get further entrance into your system. Um, so to trust the boot process, we need some way to detect that someone has tampered with that code um, while having access to the system in some way. And there's a lot of different approaches for this. And so that's a lot about what this, what this talk's going to cover. So UEFI Secure Boot is, uh, is one of the most popular approaches. There's a number of different ways to secure the boot process, but, but this is the most common. And on most of the systems that people have, this is what's, what's being used. Um, and it's by far the most popular method these days. So usually when people think about this, they associate UEFI Secure Boot with Windows. Um, and it's, it's true that it, it was started um, mostly to secure the Windows boot process but it can be used and is being used with Linux as well. Although when it was first announced, um, there was certainly a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, fright within the Linux community about how this is going to be used to prevent people from running Linux on systems altogether. I mean, you should, Slashdot was I'm sure very upset and there's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, there's a lot of fears about how this, could be, this technology could be misused. Um, so far, it hasn't really borne out that that's been the case though. Um, so, the way that, so what this does is UEFI Secure Boot ensures that boot firmware, so the, the first code that executes on the computer, has been signed using a sig with a signature that the vendor has provided. Um, only executables that have, that, that have a proper signature are allowed to run. So this works kind of similar to public key cryptography or certificates, um, if you ever visit a, a HTTPS website. 
So the firmware uh, on your system would have a public key that corresponds to a private key that the vendor, only the vendor should have and is a secret. Um, the vendor then signs executables using their private key and the boot um, and this executable provides a signature. And when, you, when um, UEFI Secure Boot, before it runs this firmware, it compares its, the signature it has and the software that it's about to run with the public key that it has built into it. If the signature checks out, then it's trusted. And again, it's important to underscore that the way that this um, enforces things is it doesn't allow an executable that has a bad signature to run. Um, Usually Microsoft is the one, Microsoft has sort of spearheaded this, um, this approach and usually vendor signatures are provided by Microsoft. Um, it was initially used to um, protect Microsoft Windows um, when it was booting and like I said, it's been extended since then. So the way that it's been extended is um, if you want any, any code to execute using UEFI Secure Boot, you need to get the vendor to sign it. And so Red Hat and Ubuntu have worked with Microsoft to get a shim, essentially a boot shim, um, signed. And the way that they work is um, you boot the system, the shim gets executed that's trusted, and then that shim allows them to load the rest of the Linux boot process. Um, let me, hold on a second, let me move this mic back here. I'm getting a lot of feedback here. All right. Um, so the thing about Secure Boot is it enforces things by disallowing you to, uh, it, will, it will block executables that aren't signed. So if you happen to use a distribution that hasn't worked with Microsoft to get a shim signed, it won't work. You won't be able to boot it. For instance, Debian is currently working on getting a shim signed, but um, to my knowledge, they have maybe the very latest stable release just got a shim signed. I'm not exactly, I'm not, I, someone maybe can check on that. Um, but last I checked, the last time I tested this, um, they hadn't. And I tested this by, um, we, at Purism, sometimes we will evaluate hardware. And one time we got this sort of low cost hardware that we were seeing how PureOS ran on it, uh, which is the operating system based on Debian that we have. And so we got this hardware, um, sort of small low cost hardware that you might, you know, you can see, uh, you see small computers like this all the time. And we went to install PureOS and we plug in the USB and we try to boot off of it and it refuses to boot. And we say, oh, okay, well that makes sense. I bet Secure Boot's enabled. Pure OS, like Debian, hasn't had a shim sh signed by Microsoft, so I'm sure Secure Boot's just stopping it. No problem, usually you can go into the firmware settings and turn off Secure Boot. So you're sort of presented with this option, you can either have zero security um, or, you can, or you can turn on Secure Boot and boot sign things. So, we go to turn it off and it turns out this particular piece of firmware um, didn't implement a configuration setting for Secure Boot. It was always on, on by default. There was no option to remove it or to disable it in this system, which meant this system could only run software that had been signed. So in addition to Secure Boot is a system called Intel Trusted Boot. And the way that this works is it uses the TPM um, to, ver to verify that only trusted code has been executed. Uh, what the TPM is, is that it's uh, an acron acronym that stands for Trusted Platform Module, and it's a discrete security chip on some motherboards. On other motherboards, it's sort of implemented on the CPU itself, um, but it, it depends on the vendor. Uh, often it's a discrete chip um, that's separate from the CPU, and ideally it's a dis discrete chip. Uh, it acts kind of like a hardware security module if you're familiar to, with those. What I mean by that is it is a standalone chip that can generate keys by itself. It can store keys securely. Um, it's, tamper res it's tamper resistant. Um, and it can perform its own crypt cryptographic operations um, slowly. Uh, it's not a super fast uh, chip. You're not going to mine bitcoins on a TPM. Um, but it can perform slow operations. Uh, and it can do it with its own keys. And this is important because, because it's, it's this discrete chip that can perform this cryptography on itself with its own keys, keys never leave this chip. So once they're generated on the chip, um, there's no way to extract them to see what they are for an attacker to get access to them. They all stay on the device. 
So the way that Intel Trusted Boot uses this is it stores measurements of executed code um, on the TPM, and TPM has these register, registers called Platform Configuration Registers, or PCRs. Um, as, as code gets executed, it gets hashed um, with uh, the previous measurement of, all the, of what had been executed and stored in these various registers. Um, then the TPM compares those measurements with known good measurements from back when you first registered these executables. And if they match, um, then the TPM will allow you to unlock a secret that it has been storing on itself. So for instance, some people will use this, this software to store a disk decryption key. So instead of requiring a user to remember a passphrase to decrypt a disk, the disk will, will use encryption, but the key is stored in the TPM only. And then the idea behind this is that if an attacker were to modify the firmware, um, then the firmware wouldn't match these measurements, the TPM would not release the disk decryption secret, and then therefore you wouldn't be able to boot the system and get access um, to you know, your employees' data, things like that. Um, and if you combine Intel Trusted Boot, boot with Secure Boot, um, you can use both to detect all kinds of different tampering in boot time executables, whether it's a firmware backdoor or all kinds of other bugs or uh, malware that might be used in firmware. Combined, this can, attempt, this can detect it and, and block it from running. Um, that said, there's a number of limitations to this system. So first uh, is that it requires uh, signatures with keys usually um, under other people's control. Usually Microsoft is the one that, um, that you need to sign these. Now, it's, it's true that you can take it upon yourself to sign executables and replace the, um, plat replace the keys that are on the system with your own keys. However, the moment that you do that, um, if you decide you want to boot Windows or Red Hat or Ubuntu with Secure Boot enabled, you need to go, you need to go and re-sign all of the ex boot executables that you would want to execute with your new keys before it would be allowed to run. Um, and to my knowledge, there, there have been some projects where people have tested this and, and attempted to do this, but they're not very widespread, um, and there's a, it's pretty difficult. Um, it's possible, but difficult enough that most people don't bother trying to replace these keys because, again, it would prevent all kinds of normal operating systems from booting on the system without you going to the trouble of signing them. Um, so the, the question was, the, the TPM has a number of different platform control registers um, that can store different values, and the question was whether you could use, perhaps, if they're zeroed out, perhaps you can use one or two of them to store extra keys. Um, the, uh, the answer is that different TPM chips have the ability to store multiple keys, um, and I, you, I don't, what I don't know is whether you can, if you want to add additional keys, whether you can add additional keys without replacing the existing keys. I believe you have to replace the existing keys with the ones that you're adding. Otherwise, an attacker with access to the system could just add extra, extra keys um, in addition, and you wouldn't be able to detect that change, right? Um, so the other limitation to this is that um, all of the software uses proprietary and closed code. Uh, which means that you can't change it if for some reason you don't like the behavior of the system. It also means that you can't audit it. Uh, this is the fundamental system that you're using for trust, to anchor trust in your, in your laptop or, or other computer, and it's all based on code that you can't audit. So you're hoping that it doesn't have either a backdoor or, or some other problem. And this is a problem because um, there, there have historically been biases in recent memory that have shipped from the manufacturer with malware in, on them, um, or at least security bugs, where it's been questionable whether it was intentional malware or an accidental bug. So this is, an, this is a legitimate problem. Um, the other th limitation with this is that, in particular with Secure Boot, what this proves is that the computer is executing code that has a valid signature. Um, it's not proving that it's executing the same code. So, this means that um, it's proving that someone somewhere blessed the code that it's executing, uh, but someone could have modified it. Some, if someone is running a different version of code that maybe has a vulnerability um, that has been, since been patched, an attacker could replace um, 
recent, a, like a recent executable without, if you're not using trusted boot, you could use an old out of date buggy with a security hole um, executable. Um, and the system would allow it because it's not necessarily testing whether things have changed. Um, the other thing is it's all, you're basically anchoring your trust ultimately in the security of Microsoft's signing, signing keys. So if for some reason those keys were leaked or they were shared or they were shared under compulsion or things like that, uh, anyone with access to those keys could create legitimate binaries that SecureBoot would allow um, and would execute for you. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily know. It could very, very well, if, if an attacker had access to those keys, they could create a legitimate looking piece of firmware that has a backdoor in it um, that SecureBoot would execute because the signatures would match. They had, it had been signed with a legitimate key. Um, this is the same sort of problem that happens when um, insecure certificate authorities get hacked and someone uses the access to the certificate authority's private keys to generate legitimate certificates that all browsers trust um, for well-known websites that everyone visits. Uh, the other limitation with this is that this only validates executables. Secure Boot's designed to validate um, things that are executing on the system. Um, it doesn't validate the initRD, in particular when it comes to Linux, it doesn't validate the initRD, which is the, fir the um, the initial root, small root file system that the Linux kernel loads that allows it to bootstrap the rest of the system. Um, SecureBoot doesn't protect against modifications to the initRD. It also doesn't protect against mod modifications to your grub settings, for instance. And this is important because sometimes people use grub settings to enable or disable certain kernel options that they don't want um, that, that impact the security of the system. And if an attacker can modify grub, they can append extra options to grub to re-enable insecure options or disable your security options. Most importantly, it's not under the user control. Um, th this system is, like many security systems these days, if you were to ask a vendor to build you a security system, nine times out of 10, they will create one that coincidentally requires you to anchor your trust in the vendor almost, almost wholly, um, and you have to therefore give them control and you hope that they are secure enough. And the idea is, well, you don't know what you're doing and we know what we're doing. And so all you need to do is give us all of your trust and everything will be fine. If you choose that you would like some fraction of that trust back, um, then you have to turn off the system uh, and you have to disable the security measure. And that, to me, that's a problem. Which leads us to a piece of software called Heads. So um, Heads is free software. It's, a, it's firmware that uh, provides similar features to secure and trusted boot combined. Um, and it, but it approaches it in a different way. So this uses the open source core boot firmware um, as, a, as a bias to initialize hardware. So if you haven't used core boot before, um, it's a open source firmware that would replace your traditional boot firmware on a system. It's um, compatible with a lot of different um, computers out there now and it allows you to boot a system without using the provided vendor BIOS or UEFI firmware. Um, there's an important distinction here. What HEADS does is provides tamper detection. It does not provide tamper proofing. And the distinction there is important. Tamper proofing is a system that, that stops someone from tampering with a file or a thing. Um, tamper detection um, doesn't stop an attacker from, from tampering with the system. It simply makes it difficult for them to tamper in an undetectable way. So think of it like a, a tamper evidence seal that you might have on an envelope or a package or, or something else. Um, that that uh, security safeguard is vulnerable to a uh, box cutter, right? You can, or one of those tamper proof, um, any kind of tamper proofing, typically a um, wire cutter or a knife will defeat it. But that's not the point. The point is that if you were to use a box cutter and slice open the tamper evidence seal, it would be obvious that someone had done that. What's difficult is to um, make it appear though it hasn't been opened. Uh, and this is the same sort of thing. Uh, the goal of heads is not to prevent someone from being able to modify the firmware. Um, anyone with physical access to the system can modify the firmware. The goal is to make it difficult to do that in a way that you can't detect when you get back to the, the machine. So the way that this works is it uses um, the TPM chip, 
on the system, although we actually have a, a version of this that doesn't even re necessarily require a TPM. Um, and it uses signing keys that are under the user's control. So all of the keys that are involved in protecting the boot process are your keys that you generate and you determine and can change at any point without impacting the security of the system. Um, heads can, it starts by being able to detect tampering in the firmware. It can extend itself to also detecting um, tampering in the kernel, also the initRD, and it extends all the way down into Grub. Uh, and actually all of the files that are in the slash boot directory, it can detect tampering in. Uh, because it relies on core boot, and core boot has a limited amount of hardware support, uh, Heads also has, at, at, it, at most, it can support hardware that core boot would support, but in reality, you need the cross section of, of hardware that supports core boot, plus enough people that are interested in Heads to port the Heads um, system to a piece of hardware. So as a result, today, the hardware support's relatively limited. So for the most part, the most common um, set of hardware that runs heads is either ThinkPad X220 or X230 series, or Librem lap, Purism Librem laptops are the main pieces of hardware. There's also a couple of different servers, like Purism has a server and there's a couple of other server um, uh, hardware that, that, that can run heads. All right, so let's talk a little bit through how this works. Since we've talked about UEFI and Trusted Boot, Heads approaches this completely differently. So first what Heads does is, um, first Core Boot runs. Core Boot's the boot firmware. It's the very first piece of code that gets executed. Um, as, it, as it runs, it loads Heads as its main payload. So what Core Boot does typically, if you're not using Heads, is it has a BIOS-like system, um, typically something called CBIOS, that when you boot core boot, it executes this program and it looks like a normal BIOS. And CBIOS allows you to see the, the bootable disks on your system. You can tell it to boot from USB if the USB is present and do basic BIOS-like operations. Um, some systems like LibreBoot, because CBIOS can contain um, binary blobs or not 100% free software, um, systems like LibreBoot go a step further and have core boot load, load grub directly because Grub can detect hardware um, and boot into hardware without needing any sort of intermediary. So LibreBoot boots, loads Grub directly. So instead of those two executables, um, Core Boot loads the Heads system and executes it. Heads is actually its own little um, miniature Linux system. Um, on Purison laptops, we have 16 megs of flash to play with. On some ThinkPads, you have four to eight, depending on how new it is. Um, that's not a whole lot of room but it's a whole embedded Linux system in that eight, four to 16 um, megs of flash. Uh, it has its own kernel and its own initRD and its own um, user space, actually. It's pretty fun. And the way that it works is it detects tampering in two different stages. So stage one is it uses the TPM chip on the system to prove that the heads itself has not been tampered with. So it uses that discrete chip, and we'll talk about how that works in a second. Um, but stage one is you need to know, ha has someone modified heads? Because you have to realize if someone can change heads, they can say, yes, there hasn't been any tampering, everything's fine. Um, so you have to figure out some way to trust heads first, because then you're going to use heads to verify the rest of the system hasn't been tampered with, which is stage two. So within heads is um, a GPG key ring, and you, all of the, the boot files have been signed with that GPG key, uh, with the private GPG key, and Heads uses the GPG key ring um, within it to verify those files before it boots. So step one, you have to trust Heads, and by trusting Heads hasn't been modified, you trust that someone hasn't injected their own public key into the key ring. Um, and then step two is to use that public key, that key ring to verify the rest of the system. If everything checks out, um, then uh, heads will read the grub config and it boots previously when you set it up you pick a default kernel and, and uh, initRD options uh, to load and it boots into it. Um, if everything checks out for the most part heads behaves a lot like it looks a lot like grub would look. Um, it's about as easy to use um, in default everything's working great as grub you turn on the system and hit enter and it boots. In fact, we're actually working now on just on a, to make it automatically boot if everything's okay within a certain amount of time. So let's start with um, detecting tampering within heads itself. 
so stage one is we use the TPM to prove that heads itself hasn't been tampered with. And this is challenging because you're asking the system in a way uh, to prove that you have to, you're challenging the system to prove that it hasn't been tampered with. So how do you do that? So first, um, in the TPM, the TPM stores hashes of, the, of known good executables in those platform configuration registers. So at some point when you first set this up, you register the known good measurements for the code, the heads code that you're going to execute, and it stores those. Um, in addition to that, it generates a TLTP slash HOTP secret um, using a, a piece of software that Matthew Garrett wrote called TPM TOTP. And what this does is it runs on the command line and TPM TOTP uh, generates a uh, long secret and stores that secret in the TPM. And it also will generate to the screen, it outputs a QR code. And so, um, Let's back up and talk a little bit about this, uh, about TOTP and HOTP. If you've ever used two-factor authentication applications on your phone that have you, that generate a six-digit code that changes every, you know, like 30 seconds, then you've used TOTP. So that's a, a time-based uh, one-time password. Um, and what that does is it combines the shared secret that you're, that you have, in the case of a phone app, your phone has a copy of the secret. The remote system, if you're using, using this for a website, the remote server has a copy of the secret. You both combine that secret with the current time and generate a six-digit code. Um, in the case of websites, if you're using a two-factor authentication system, you're giving them your six-digit code and authenticating to the website. The website takes your code and says, does this match what I made? If it matches the code I generated, then you must have a copy of the secret key and be legitimate, so it allows you on. In this case, it flips it on its head. Um, so, no pun intended. Well, pun always intended. So, uh, with, with heads, um, the system is authentic authenticating itself to you. So, when it boots, it will generate a six-digit code and show it to you, and then you get your phone out and see and generate the six-digit code using your authentication application and compare them. If it matches, then that's evidence that it has been tampered with. We'll talk about why here in a second. Because what happens is as heads boots, it starts sending measurements of itself to the TPM and it's storing them in these platform control registers. Um, each different PCR is assigned to different stages of the boot code and as it progresses through the process, there's different PCRs that get allocated with, with measurements. Um, and like I said before, it takes the current hash and combines it with uh, the previous hash and combines it with a hash of the current executable and stores it in that register. Um, so what happens is the TPM, the shared secret that you may have set up before, is only unlocked um, if all of these hash hashes match. So if someone were to modify one of the hashes and heads, the measurements won't match anymore and the TPM will not release that secret. Um, if they all match, then the TPM releases that secret. Uh, so, the way that this typically works these days is instead of using that two-digit code, because the, the downside with using a phone to authenticate your computer is most people will not do it. If we say, well, every time you boot your computer, all you got to do is turn it on, get your phone out, unlock your phone, launch your authentication app, wait for the 30 seconds to refresh, and then compare your six-digit code, and if it matches, then hit enter. Uh, most people will probably do that once, they might do it twice. Uh, or they might do it when they feel that they are particularly at risk, but for the most part, people will get tired of that pretty quickly and just hit enter and say, don't worry about it. So in, in light of that, we thought about that and said, well, what would be better is if we somehow um, were able to in integrate this with a hardware dongle of some kind. So we worked with Nitro Key um, to create either a Nitro Key or a Librem Key can integrate with heads in this way. And what it does is it plugs into the USB port and it uses, instead of TLTP, it uses a protocol called HOTP. Um, so TOTP is um, basically an imp implementation of HOTP. And the way the HOTP works is very similar. It has a shared secret, but instead of the current time, it has an auto incrementing counter that it always uses. So um, it'll combine this secret with say the counter set to 10 right now. It'll 10, both sides have a copy of the incremented counter and they have a copy of the secret. They combine them, if they match, then they both increment the counter and move on. Uh, in the case of TLTP, it's the same thing, it's just the auto-incrementing counter is the time, and the time is always incrementing. 
So what we decided to do uh, is because the, the Librem key or a Nitro key doesn't have a, a battery and a clock of its own, there's no point in, in having it try to use uh, TOTP because it would have to ask the system what time is it. Screen that you can take a picture of, it, you also plug in your key and uh, your system will send a copy of the shared secret over USB to be stored in the key along with uh, negotiating the counter to start with. Then the next time you boot your system, um, if everything matches, it generates a six-digit code. It generates a, the, and the TOTP code it shows to the screen. The HOTP code, it sends over USB to your key. The key itself can generate its own version. It has its own copy of the secret. And it compares what it was given uh, with what it generated itself. If it matches, it blinks a bright green light. If it doesn't match, it blinks a bright red light. And the idea is to make this very easy for, for anybody to validate the security of their system. So you turn on the machine, you plug in your key, and if it's green, you're good. If it's red, you're bad. It's a lot easier than having to use, take out a phone and use an app. Um, that said, if you lose your key, um, one, of the, one of the nice things about Heads is it doesn't lock you out of your system in any of these stages. Like, traditionally, things, secure boot systems um, default to, if there's some sort of problem, shut it down. You can't do anything. Um, in this case, it's more alerting you to tampering, and then you can decide yourself with your own hardware what you want to do. So if you lose your, your key, you can still validate the security of, of this by falling back to that TOTP code. At that point, if you lose your key or don't have it, you can get the app out and compare those, digit, those six digits, and then maybe you get a new key later and you can re-enroll a new key. Um, Oh, yeah, I already talked about that. So um, if heads changes in some way, whether legitimately or illegitimately, um, the measurements for heads will change, and therefore the TPM won't unlock the code, and so it won't be able to generate a secret and will report an error, and your key won't blink any color at all because it can't, it's not getting, receiving a code. Um, otherwise, if the attacker is more clever and they modify the TPM, say they reflash it with their own software, or not their own software, but they change all of the keys in the TPM with, they, they modify the firmware, they store new measurements in the TPM. Well, whenever you um, change the TPM and take ownership of it, it erases whatever it currently had in it. That includes whatever shared secret you had before. So now it has to generate a new secret. Um, if it does, if they, the attacker does that, that six-digit code's not going to match what your, your key has or your phone has, and so you'll be able to detect it. So, um, once we get to this point, um, HEADS is able to prove that it hasn't been tampered with um, through a green light or the TOTP code matching. And once you trust HEADS, then we can move on to protecting boot. So this uses GPG keys. So the second stage is to use the GPG keys that you provided HEADS to, verify, to prove the files in boot are not tampered with. Uh, the way that it does this is HEADS itself contains a sort of a classic GPG key ring. It's in the home directory. Um, it's like any other GPG key ring. In fact, uh, within that 16, 4 to 16 megs of flash is a, a stripped-down version of GPG along with all kinds of like your standard command line tools. Um, so what that means you can do is you can store uh, the, the private parts of your GPG key on some sort of um, hardware smart card. So Librem key, Nitro key, UB keys, et cetera, they all work. Um, anything that can store an open, that can act like an open PGP smart card and store GPG private keys could work for this. Um, so Heads also stores configuration files in boot that keep track of various things like your default boot selection, things like that, and it signs those with your private key. In addition, um, it's, it takes checksums of all the files in boot, puts those in a file, and signs that file with your private key as well. Before, when you boot and you trust your firmware now, um, before it boots into the OS, it scans through all of slash boot and checks all of those checksums um, against the checksums you have in the file and also checks the signature on that file to make sure it hasn't been modified. If all of that matches, then it knows that no files in boot have been changed, and that includes kernels and nitrd and your grub config. Uh, if the attacker were to install a, a rootkit, it would modify one of those files, right? It would modify either the initrd or the kernel itself, um, and heads will see that, and it'll complain that a signature didn't match, and it, it will alert you to that and won't boot. Um, again, you can 
choose to bypass this. We don't lock you out of the system, um, but it will alert you to that, that something's, something's been detected. So the thing about this is it presents some usability challenges uh, when you're creating a system like this that, that you have to be really thoughtful about. And, and the challenge with security over the last couple of decades is for the most part, a lot of people have come up with security systems without thinking about the end user, um, like, like password schemes. Uh, password schemes are the worst example of this, uh, where uh, people didn't really think about how end users would, would interpret password uh, policy and just thought about what they wanted to accomplish. So if your system is fine and nothing has changed, Heads is as easy as using Grub. Um, you boot the system, hit enter, and your, your system boots. It's very simple. Uh, the challenge comes when something changes on the system. Uh, alert fatigue is real, and it's a very big challenge when you're using something like Heads um, because sometimes your system does change. If you're in a system that never changes, then it's perfectly easy. So first, um, if you ever choose to reflash your BIOS, for instance, with an updated version, which is relatively rare, but if you do that, you also need to update uh, the shared secret between your, um, your, phone, and your, uh, your phone or your key. Uh, the reason you need to do that is all the measurements have now changed. So when the measurements change, you also have to update the secret um, and resync. So that means if I flash the BIOS, I then get prompted at the next boot, hey, you flash the BIOS. And by the way, you can flash the BIOS from within the BIOS with heads. It includes flash ROM, which allows you to update it within itself, which is pretty nice. Um, but if you do that, it'll say, hey, the BIOS has changed. I'm built to detect this. And say, yes, I know. Um, that's fine. I need to update the measurements. So it will ask you to present your, your Nitro key or Librem key and plug it in, enter in an admin code for that, and reset um, the shared secret. If you change files and boot, you have to plug in your smart card because you need to re-sign all of those files that have changed with an updated signature. So that's an extra step that you have to think about. The challenge here is how do you tell legitimate changes from attacks? Um, in particular, if you don't reboot very often. Um, some OSs don't reboot in between updates. Uh, and some people have a badge of honor at the uptime on their laptop because they just couldn't apply. It's kind of nice that in Linux, for the most part, you can update software if it's not the kernel without rebooting. Um, the challenge is, is telling those legitimate changes from attacks. So with bias warnings, it's not a big deal because for the most part, people don't update their bias maybe ever. Uh, they might do it once if there's some particular security vulnerability they hear about. And so it's relatively rare. And so for the most part, if you boot your system and it says the bias has changed, um, heads is detected, is not able to verify and your, and your key blinks red, you know there's a big problem. That's, you're not necessarily going to get alert fatigue with that. That makes sense. The challenge is in um, slash boot because uh, the initrd and grub files change relatively frequently as you update your system. If you update your kernel, these files change. Um, if you change your grub config in any way, obviously these files change. Uh, on a lot of systems, a surprising number of packages will cause the initrd to be updated. Uh, packages you may not even expect to do this. And so as a result, if you use heads on a system and you do a package update, you may get an alert before it boots into the system again that the initrd has changed. It's relatively common. So the challenge is telling legitimate versus illegitimate ver changes. So uh, one simple way to do this would be to say, if the files are the same before the package updates uh, and they're only changed after, um, after you've applied an update, it's probably, probably legitimate. So the way you would do that is maybe take a set of checksums for files, store them somewhere, do a package update, and then compare them afterwards. And you can, that's one approach. Um, if after you've, uh, oh, sorry, if, if it's, yeah. So if the files were different before you applied the package manager, then it's, there's possibly tampering. Uh, this is less of a problem on systems that use, uh, they use something like Package Kit, which will reboot in between updates, uh, which is nice because it reboots into more of a secure, stripped down, limited environment, applies updates, then reboots again. If you're on a system like PureOS does this, where typically you'll get a, a prompt that, hey, you have system updates, would you like to apply them? And it reboots and, apply them, and applies them. That works very well with heads because you first boot, you reboot, you see that head says everything looks good, the boot files have been, haven't been changed, the firmware hasn't been changed, then you go and apply updates, 
And then when you reboot, it says, hey, um, this file and this file have changed. And it makes sense to you because you know that you were about to update the kernel or whatever. And so you, you feel more comfortable than re-signing files in boot. The other challenge is, so what should a user actually do if, it, if they detect tampering? Um, it depends. Uh, some users are, are very are sophisticated and savvy that are using the system, and if it says it's, it's been tampered with, they can take measures into their own hands, maybe um, remove the hard drive and inspect that with a certain set of tools on another trusted system, or they might be able to, some, to check the firmware in some way to see what has been modified and why, uh, maybe even go to the trouble of doing a hardware flash if they don't necessarily trust the system to flash itself. Um, a less sophisticated user may or may not know what to do. So um, in our case, uh, with, with at putting my purism hat on for a second, that means on our side, we, provide, we end up providing support for people who would run into this. Of course, the challenge is how to tell whether it's saying this because they just did a package update or not. It, and that's, that's one of the bigger challenges. Um, basically, the key is to have sane defaults, have it be as simple as it possibly can be, and have it just sort of make sense what settings you have in place. And then when you do have an alert, providing actionable information. So not just to say, warning, warning, there's a problem, but say, here's what I think has happened. This, could, this is likely this or likely that. And then give the user a couple of basic options of what they, how they, what they want to do. And there's still a lot of improvement in heads to be done along this line. Uh, there's a lot of UI. We, we've per, um, my team has put a lot of focus on improving the user experience on heads from what it was before we started. Um, and it's come a long way, but there's, a, lot of, there's a, a long way to go as well before I would feel comfortable saying everybody should install it by default um, instead of core boot. So what's the current status? Um, we have some somewhat limited hardware support uh, still because, again, it's the cross-section of things that run core boot and also things that um, people that are so interested in security they want to run heads are willing to port heads over to. So what that means is it started with the X220 and 230, and that's um, very popular. The, the challenge with that is it, it, the first put it on the system, you need to hardware flash. So that means getting a BeagleBone or a Raspberry Pi or something, Pomona Clip or some other system that allows you to flash uh, firmware, and then opening your laptop, performing surgery essentially on it. And once you get the first hardware flash going and have core boot on it, from that point you can then flash over software. But that's, that's a big roadblock for a lot of people. They don't necessarily want to go to that trouble. Um, as a result of that, uh, that started sort of like a, a cottage industry where both Nitro Key and a company called Insurgo uh, are offering used X230s that they have then taken in, and gone to the trouble of reflashing uh, with, with heads for you, um, and then getting it all set up and ready for you. Um, also, Purism is another company that supports this. So we have it uh, as part of our, you can either choose regular core boot or if you choose what we call pure boot, which is heads plus a bunch of other stuff, um, we will pre-install it on a system and support it on um, all of our laptops and also our ser server line. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's just a pre-install option. If people select that, they usually they have to select it with a key. And at the factory, you basically set it all up with the key and get it all set up and send, send it to people. Um, and as I mentioned this before, uh, right now, a lot of the core efforts in heads, a lot of the changes you're seeing are either around um, hard, better hardware support. There are people that have laptops that want heads to run on it, and they're starting to try to port it. Um, or it's work on just improving the overall UI to make it easier to use. Um, all right, well, let's see if we can do a demo. This means changing the video um, output to a different laptop. So let's see what happens. Da, da, da. All right, so I'm going to turn on the system. It probably will take a second to pick up there. Um, but what's going to happen, I'm going to turn this look right here if you can. Okay, starting to boot. You may or may not be able to see a little green light flashing for a second here. You, um, the front row can, in the back, who knows, LEDs. Um, but basically, this green light is telling me that this is a safe system. And you can see the overall interface here. So when I see that green light, I trust the system. I can hit Enter now um, and could go into heads and start booting. Otherwise, there's options like you might see in a regular BIOS, except it's a little different because this is a full-on Linux user space. We can do all kinds of stuff. So um, in many ways, it's, it's, this is offers me as a, on the with a customer support hat on an easier way to 
get people out of problems in their system because the recovery console is a full-on Linux user space. So there's way more options than you would have, say, in a grub uh, command line to fix the system. Um, so there's all kinds of options. Uh, you can see different boot options. This allows you to boot off of USB, things like that. Um, there's even a whole suite of, for example, let's go down and look at GPG options where I can see the current status of the GPG key ring and change keys and generate keys and do all that sort of thing. Of course, I can also drop to a shell and run GPG on the command line if I really wanted to. Um, let's go back to the main system. All right. Uh, but let's say that we want to uh, simulate a, uh, an attacker. All right. So how will we do that? Well, the best way to quickly simulate an attacker is for me to remove this key. So let's say I have this, and say the attacker comes in and wants to, um, and will overwrite the TPM with its own set of measurements, all right? Generate a new shared secret. So the way that we do that is we go into the HOTP options, and we say they generate a new secret. So now when I generate the new secret, it's going to erase my old secret and replace it with a new one. Do I want to proceed? Yes. There's a QR code. It's trying to talk to my Librem key. It can't because I'm not plugging it in. I say, OK. It's begging me. I say no. Um, doesn't like it. And then it reboots or it resets. So now it's, it's asking me to plug it back in, right? So um, it gives me a little warning when you don't have it plugged in. But again, it doesn't stop you from booting. You can lose this and still boot your system if you want. Um, so what we're going to do now is now I will turn it off, turn the system back on with the Librem key plugged in. All right. All right, here we go. So now because the secret, I, the key still has the old secret, the laptop has a new secret, they don't match, it's going to send a different six-digit code. And when it does, you get a red screen, but more importantly, you get a little red blinky light. All right. Um, and the, the, we've configured the firmware here, so the blinky light blinks as long as it's plugged in. So even if some people we've said, well, what if I'm red, green, colorblind? Uh, how can I deal with that? Well, the green, uh, the green light only flashes a limited number of times and then stops. The red light never stops. So as long as it's plugged in, it will continue flashing red until you unplug it. So that's another indicator. Uh, we've also modified the case on this to be translucent. And the idea there is on a server product, you, might, you could even potentially have this plugged in and invisible through a, a security camera and for the most, and remotely boot and then check what, and be able to see because it's relatively bright, uh, whether it's red or green when you first boot into a system by looking through the camera. But again, we do the red screen here, but this could be lies. So you should never really look at the screen. You can't trust the computer. What you can trust is this key because the idea is this key goes in your pocket. If you take your laptop and you go uh, travel somewhere remotely and leave your laptop in your hotel room, uh, the key doesn't go in your hotel room. The key stays in your pocket. Levi's jeans actually have implemented a, a pocket for us for the Librem key. It's like small. It's above the, the main right side pocket. And it fits perfectly in this, this specially made pocket. Um, and so you walk around with it in this pocket. And then when you come back, I wonder if the evil maid has compromised my laptop. You plug in the key, you turn on the system, and if it blinks green, you know that it's fine. If it blinks red, you know it's questionable. Especially this is valuable on trips because for the most part, you shouldn't be updating software, especially if you're going to go travel overseas with your corporate laptop, it's not a good time to provide, to install updates, right? So typically, you should leave with a sealed locked system. You go travel. When you come back, you can plug in your key and verify that everything is the same. And if it's not, you know you have a really good indication that something might be, not be legitimate. All right. Um, well, that's... Let's see if this even works. This is even more questionable whether I can plug this back in here. Um, hey. All right, so um, let's open it up to questions, which means we're going to um, hand you the mic. And then if anyone has any questions, raise your hand and have one back there. A lot of us are interested in security, not of x86, 64 necessarily, but uh, ARM devices for IoT and robotics and so forth. Um, a lot of those systems are safety critical, and so maybe even 
more important to check the validity of artifacts than laptops. Mm -hmm. um, Heads itself is running in these systems on a, a microcontroller that's x86-64, is that, is that right? What is Heads itself running on? And then another just real quick question is, an alternative to preventing heads from being tampered with is blowing fuses, uh, as opposed to this sort of validity check. I mean, I, blowing fuses isn't completely undefeatable, but requires a high level of expertise. Okay, yeah, so, so there's two questions. I'll just repeat the questions. Um, so the first question has to do about um, heads on non-x86 platforms, so, and, and, also, and also what heads is running on on this. So heads is running on um, this, the BIOS chip, which is like an STM, it's not x86. It's r running on its own little discrete chip. I'm not familiar enough with electronics to know exactly which platform it is, but I do know that when we build heads, we cross-compile it. Yes, if you go to the heads page, yeah, the question was, is, is it on these resources? Yeah, if you go to the, the official heads page, you should be able, and download the code, you should be able to see what platform it's cross-compiling for. Um, uh, ultimately, if you wanted to port heads to any other platform, there's nothing specifically x86 specific about it. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that you're running on a system that's using core boot. So if you're using, if you're going to an ARM platform that doesn't use core boot, then you would, what you would need to do is in that platform, whatever boot firmware that the first little bit of code that gets executed would lead to boot the head's kernel, and then within user space, um, and you would have to approximate how you're gonna either use the equivalent of a TPM, if you have it, or if not, it's less than ideal, but what you can do is have the system send measure, turns, wh what we do on systems that don't have a TPM is we have the measure, we have the system essentially take its own measurements uh, using flash ROM. It takes the measurements of the entire flash. It takes longer to do this, but it reads the entire flash, converts it into a hash, and generates a six-digit checksum, a six-digit code based on that hash, and sends it across. And the key has um, a version of that hash um, from a known good measurement. And there are ways to fake that, but that's the approach. The second question was about blowing fuses. Um, so the idea there uh, is, to lock the very first piece of code that gets executed on the system in place so that it can't be changed. So the idea is you, you the burn fuse, the idea of, of burning the fuse is to, to block writes. So you, it's re, it becomes read only at that point. Um, that's, that would be an ideal way if you're on a system that you didn't want, if you, if you had that concern and you weren't concerned about the follow-up, which is it prevents you from updating, right? So it's, that's the trade-off. Um, any other questions? Yeah, we have one in the back there. For a larger organization, let's say that you're going to do two or 300 laptops, could you deploy a common key so that it would be easy to deal with updates that are occurring in the remote field? so you don't have to have the user support problem that you kind of mentioned? Yeah, so the question was about um, for large fleets using this, could you have a shared key? Well, so because it's using GPG, and it's in particular, most importantly, using a GPG key ring, um, you can add multiple, key all the keys in that, that are in that key ring are considered trusted. So you could have the option of having a user and a fleet key in that key ring and both be trusted. Now, currently to date, um, no one has implemented like enterprise-like features in heads like that. For example, another thing that an enterprise may want is to disallow a user from booting into a system um, that has been tampered with in some way, and instead maybe pop up a custom, send this to IT, here's the number, or here's the procedure, or whatever, right? That's completely doable, though. I mean, heads is, again, it's, it's all free software. So heads is relatively easy to modify in that sense with the user space. So it would just be a matter of, of either contracting with someone to build, to add that extra feature in the heads for a fleet. Um, and as far as a large enterprise engagement, I think that's a pretty feasible thing, for sure. Um, yeah, one in the back and then two more down here. Yeah, the back first. Question is, does it work on a Mac? I don't know. I don't think they want you to run code that's not blessed by Mac. 
Yeah, I, I think if you're using a Mac, then um, then you're sort of locked. In, you you you're tied into that ecosystem a lot, and you really need to rely on that. The, I, their security model is all based on trust, full trust in the vendor, and so you need to you need to you're sort of required to use their security tools if you want to use that platform because all trust is hinged on trust in Apple. So one of the most common uses in the field of using a TPM is to back the disk encryption key with the TPM so that it can't be extracted from the system and it won't boot if the system's been tampered with. But as far as I know, the only uh, like commercially commercial grade or available system that is you know one integrated way of doing this is Windows BitLocker or the, the Mac OS disk encryption. Is there does heads offer this functionality, or is there a way to do that with heads, where instead of having to enter, say, a Lux key when you boot the system, the system will use the trust generated by heads as a way of unlocking the disk? Yeah, so the question is whether you can have a system where, with heads, can you store a Lux de decryption secret or some other secret to d unlock the disk within heads itself using the TPM? The answer is yes. Um, we don't use it at, on Purism laptops by, in our default config, but when you are, are setting up heads, there's an option to store a Lux secret in the TPM along with other secrets that are being stored there. And if you set that up, what happens is um, it will get combined with what the user types in. So it's two factors. So instead of, instead of defeating the whole point of this encryption by saying, well, I can turn on the system and, and unlock the system with no user interaction, um, when Lux uh, when you type in your Lux secret, it gets combined with that TPM secret, and that becomes your full passphrase. So yeah, it's, it's supported today. Cool. 